Uh, this particular provost forum is titled Insights from the History of Terrorism, and our speaker is Dr. Randy Law. Dr. Law is, is an associate professor of history. He joined the Birmingham Southern F College faculty in 2003. He received his BA from Amherst College, MA from Yale University, and his PhD from Georgetown University. He is the editor of a forthcoming volume uh, by Rutledge Press, The History of Terrorism, and he is an adjunct fellow at the American Security Project in Washington, D.C. Some of his interests are Russia, particularly 19th and 20th century history and modern Germany, Europe since the French Revolution, history of education, history of terrorism, and I'm tempted to say, and here's our own resident terrorism person, but uh, Dr. Law, thank you. I, I was at a, uh, a conference a couple weekends ago and, and giving a paper on uh, Russian revolutionary terrorism, and one of my mentors from graduate school was in the, off, uh, in the audience, and he said, uh, they are taking the stage now, our own Russian revolutionary terrorist, referring to the beer and all that. I said, it's the, uh, it's the Stanislavski method of research. You have to, you have to live it uh, to, uh, uh, to, to write on it. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this talk is in... Um, I guess fulfillment of an obligation, having received the uh, McWilliams Prize last um, spring for faculty scholarship, and it's uh, it's a tremendous honor uh, to get to give this talk. Um, receiving the McWilliams Prize uh, is one of the, the, the great honors that I have enjoyed in my life. Um, I, I, I appreciate the uh, the colleges um, um, having this award to give out annually to a faculty member. I appreciate certainly. Uh, the, uh, uh, the generous fine of it by the McWilliams family. Um, <clears throat> where do we stand uh, in the war on terror? That's the subject of my, of my talk today. Particularly as we approach the one-year anniversary of the death of Osama bin Laden, just a few weeks away now. Uh, we're now ten and a half years into the war on terror, uh, which is, makes, uh, gives us the opportunity for a really extraordinary thought for undergraduates here at Birmingham Southern, um, they were eight, nine, ten years old um, when uh, the 9-11 um, the attacks were carried out. Um, so this is their world. This is the world that they have known. Um, how successful have we been in the war on terror? And uh, where are we going? Uh, these are questions that um, to a great degree are probably best suited for the men and women in the military, um, in our security organs, uh, agencies, our government, our policymakers. Uh, when we're speaking of academics, my uh, friends and colleagues in the, uh, the social sciences uh, who are particularly focused on contemporary events and, and policy. Uh, but there are also, these are also questions, where do we stand in the war on terror, that are, um, that historians, those in the humanities in general, but historians in particular are, I, I think, um, particularly well-placed to add something fruitful to the discussion for two reasons. First of all, uh, historians, um, because of what they do, benefit from the hindsight, from the, from the wisdom that comes with hindsight, uh, from adopting a long view um, that places current events, uh, in fact, all events, in a, as many different uh, contexts as possible. Um, uh, historians sort of like to imagine that they've seen it all before um, and are well versed in how uh, every policy that could be imagined has been uh, tried at least once and has failed probably many more times than that. Uh, second, um, historians are also generally not on the hook uh, for making policy recommendations in the here and now. They are free to, uh, to uh, sling darts um, to problematize what we tend to assume. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that when they do make recommendations, they tend to be ignored. Um, so one of my goals as an academic is to be louder. Um, and so uh, this is the, uh, the affiliation that Dr. Hagen mentioned. I'm this, uh, an adjunct fellow at the American Security Project, which is a, a DC think tank, and it gives me some opportunities to speak to f policymakers and to provide uh, what wisdom I might have. 
So, where are we in the, where do we stand in the war on terror? Forgive me, I'm already on the verge of losing my voice, so a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, stops to uh, lubricate the vocal cords. Um, how successful has the U.S. been in the war on terror? It, of course, all depends on the metrics, the standards that we, uh, we choose to use, that we choose to, uh, to, to measure our progress by. In a very real, very significant way, uh, the U.S. government, the military, our security agencies have been very successful um, since 9-11, since there have been no large-scale attacks by uh, jihadis, uh, Islamists, uh, militants on U.S. soil. Uh, this is uh, very much not for a lack of trying. Uh, the list of attempted, failed um, uh, plots from Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-inspired affiliates is long and um, bizarre uh, and troubling. Um, some that you might remember, some old, some new. Uh, Richard Reed, uh, the so-called shoe bomber uh, from December 2001 who tried to set up a bomb hidden in his shoe um, uh, while aboard a passenger plane. Uh, the so-called um, uh, underwear bomber, more recently, Farouk uh, Abdul Muttalib, um, who tried to set off a bomb hidden in his underwear, in his uh, shorts, um, in a plane over Detroit, uh, Christmas Day 2009. Um, also recently, the Times Square car bomb attempt in, uh, uh, two years ago, May 2010, I guess. Um, an uh, Al-Qaeda affiliate tried to send uh, mail bombs through cargo planes, about a year and a half ago, a host of other attempts as well. Um, all of them have been failed, either by a combination of, 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 of luck um, or uh, infiltration, intelligence gathering, very diligent work by, um, by American uh, security agencies. Also, the chief 9-11 plotter, um, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, was captured a couple years after 9-11 in Pakistan, uh, and he's set to go on trial um, in a military court, uh, but nonetheless a, a court that bears a lot of resemblance to uh, a civilian court, which is going to be a really interesting test. Uh, the world is looking at this. Can, uh, in part, can, uh, uh, can terrorism be countered? Um, can terroristic criminals be punished uh, using the same venues uh, or reasonable facsimiles thereof, uh, that are used against much more conventional crime. We will see. Um, but the cost of this victory, or I guess we could say this absence of, of glaring defeat in the last 10 years, um, uh, the cost of this has been very, very high. It's been, in fact, quite extraordinarily high. First of all, we have the billions Billions of dollars that have been really quite wastefully, almost you could even say criminally ill-spent on anti-terrorism um, in the mad rush to defend ourselves uh, after 9-11. Almost a sense that it's better to, to, to do something, to appear busy, even if it's not very substantive. Uh, in the mad rush to defend ourselves, to, to, f to prepare ourselves for threats that we didn't understand at all, um, we spent extraordinary sums of money on federal state monies, private organizations. Um, for example, do, do Midwestern rural sheriff's offices need um, millions of dollars of equipment for uh, seeking out bombs, hazmat suits for dealing with chemical weapons attacks, uh, things of this sort. We have convinced ourselves so thoroughly uh, that ter terrorists, whatever their background, typically of course we imagine them to be Islamists or jihadists, we've convinced ourselves that they can strike anyone, anywhere, that we are all vulnerable, uh, no matter where we are. Uh, and that that's what they, whoever they might be, seek. Well, it's a, it's a pretty fundamental misunderstanding of how terrorism operates and, um, and how Al-Qaeda has operated. Al-Qaeda isn't interested in rural Kansas farmers. Um, what has Al-Qaeda targeted? Passenger planes, um, major landmarks, urban areas. There's a fundamental misunderstanding of how this strategy uh, operates. Uh, this reflects a, a, a broader problem um, which is uh, this ingrained 
now, for most of us, commonplace, oddly enough, sense of paranoia over the last 10 years, uh, inculcated uh, in large part by the government uh, and by sort of a terrorism industry, we might say, um, that tends to spread its own brand of fear um, and its own insecurity, sometimes as part of a, um, a well-intentioned effort to educate that often attends or protect that tends often to, uh, to, to terrify itself, oddly enough. Um, we, of course, also have a dramatically enlarged uh, security apparatus, uh, including an entirely new branch of the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, that was hastily cobbled together uh, in the months after 9-11. It, you know, the, the intention was to unify intelligence gathering and analysis, and what it did is added a new agency to the alphabet soup of the federal government. Uh, itself has sweeping new powers, but others uh, do as well. Um, the government has spent sums, uh, created institutions, um, infringed on civil liberties in a way that it didn't in the 40, during the 45-year Cold War, um, when we, we have... We have spent sums of money, we've, we've engaged in tasks, we've undermined civil liberties in ways that we didn't do when we were faced with the existential threat of Soviet communism and um, nuclear annihilation. Um, we, we arm ourselves uh, uh, against uh, the possibility of terrorist attack in a way that we never did in a lot of ways against real substantive threats from the Soviet Union. I find that uh, disturbing and it's indicative of how we understand terrorism as an inchoate threat um, uh, against which, well, any expenditure is necessary and can unfortunately be, uh, be justified. Another consequence, of course we've fought two wars. The first in Afghanistan, um, which is still ongoing. Uh, the war in Afghanistan was launched shortly after 9-11. Uh, its goals at the time were quite clear. Capture or kill Osama bin Laden, destroy al-Qaeda, overthrow the Taliban regime uh, that, um, that had sheltered uh, bin Laden and al-Qaeda, um, ensure that Afghanistan could not be used again uh, to... Uh, as a launching pad for terrorist attacks on the United States. Uh, the record of that war is, is mixed in part because although the Taliban has been overthrown, uh, it hasn't gone away 10 years uh, on, we are, we are mired in a war whose outcome is unknown, uh, trying to uh, keep the Taliban at bay and construct a nation in Afghanistan where one has never existed in any sort of Western sense. Um, partially, of course, the record is mixed because it took us a decade to get bin Laden. Um, uh, and, and, of course, all of this is in part because along the way, the United States got distracted by um, a new uh, and elective war. Um, this is the second war that I mentioned. Of course, the war in Iraq, which began in the spring of 2003, um, where the participation of American troops is is just about at an end. Uh, most uh, functions uh, fulfilled by the military, uh, by, the, by the US military, have been handed over to Iraqi authorities and Iraqi troops. Um, but only after the death of, of thousands of Americans and hundreds of thousands of uh, Iraqis, uh, the expenditure of, of hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars, of course, coming at a time when we have now become so ultra focused on the national debt, recession at home, uh, so on and so forth. Now, we can debate endlessly um, the merits of the Iraq war on, I guess we could call it humanitarian grounds. Uh, without, um, without debate, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator. He was, a, he was an absolutely awful man. Um, and the war led to his ouster and the creation of a fledgling, though uh, highly imperfect, um, uh, democracy in Iraq. That's not what I'm interested in debating. That's a, that's a debate worth having. That's a question worth exploring. But that's not the one that here primarily interests me. What is beyond debate was that Iraq in 2003 uh, was a war of choice. This was an elective war. This is a war that we chose to begin um, as much as we 
constructed it publicly as a defensive uh, act. Saddam had gotten rid of his weapons of mass destruction, and there was enough intelligence that told us that. The problem was that the intelligence was so thoroughly politicized and cherry-picked. Um, if you seek an answer, you can find it in the, in the morass of thousands of pages of intelligence documents. Um, even more importantly, Saddam Hussein had no link to the 9-11 attacks, although the suggestions to the contrary uh, were a, uh, a constant refrain of the Bush administration uh, in the uh, year and a half between 9-11 and the beginning of the uh, uh, Iraq war. I give a quiz most years that I, uh, at the beginning of the term when I teach my history of terrorism course. Um, and one of the questions is how many of the 9-11 hijackers were Iraqis? Um, and I routinely get answers. The average student says uh, anywhere from half to two-thirds, even all of the 9-11 hijackers were Iraqis. Well, that's demonstrably false. It simply is not true. Um, virtually all of them, 15 of them, were Saudis. Uh, um, from a country that is one of our uh, staunchest allies uh, in the, the reason in the region. So, frankly, why do people believe this nonsense? Um, it's because um, at the time, and particularly since then, 9-11, the war on terror, the invasion of Iraq have been fused in our minds. They are all of a piece. Um, 9 uh, the war in Iraq became a front in the war on terror. We re refer to it as part of the war on terror. The horrible, terrible irony is that the Iraq War became a front uh, in the War on Terror um, because we invaded. It became a front in the War on Terror because the American plan for dealing with the aftermath of the war um, was so comically, and again I would say criminally bungled, um, that the U.S. created uh, an ungovernable uh, anarchic mess in uh, Iraq, uh, a country that became a wash in weapons, um, demobilized soldiers, uh, and increasingly entrenched uh, bitterness, that if you understand the history of terrorism, is the formula for creating a terrorist safe haven. Um, and uh, because of how the operation, the occupation was bungled, uh, we created an opportunity uh, for terrorists uh, who were opposed to the United States, the new Shia-dominated government, and very importantly, moderate Muslims in the area, uh, to, um, to uh, operate. Uh, we provided a, a perfect recruiting tool. Think, of course, of Abu Ghraib uh, for drawing terrorists, international terrorists, uh, into a new terrorist campaign. Iraq became the focal point of an international uh, jihadist campaign against the United States in much the same way that Afghanistan had been in the 1980s against the uh, Soviets. Uh, as I like to put it, the United States became enablers uh, of uh, terrorism, of a new outburst of, oddly enough, Iraqi, excuse me, Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism. Um, and also, this was, we need to remind ourselves, a campaign that claimed um, far, far more Iraqis and Muslims than it did um, uh, Americans, far more civilians than, um, than soldiers. And it, of course, did much to, to, to destabilize uh, and continue to undermine this democracy that we often like to tout as being the result of the, um, the Iraq War. Um, uh, but back to the war in Afghanistan. I want to comment on that a little bit more. How do we, how do we evaluate that? How do we make sense of our uh, progress um, in uh, Afghanistan? We have, in fact, been largely successful in limiting the effectiveness of al-Qaeda uh, based in uh, Afghanistan and, to a great extent, also in Pakistan. Um, in the first years of the war, we captured or killed uh, quite a bit of the uh, leadership of al-Qaeda, even though we didn't get bin Laden uh, for a decade. Um, but al-Qaeda was able to restock itself, keep planning operations. Um, but in recent years, the United States has once again killed much of al-Qaeda's leadership in Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. 
Many of them through the use of these missile firing unmanned uh, drones that are operated not really by the military, but a very heavily militarized CIA, which is another consequence of the war on terror. Uh, we've taken uh, a, an intelligence gathering operation, uh, uh, adapted covert operations, and turned it in many ways into a branch of the CIA. One of the best uh, uh, demonstrations of that development is who is now the head of the CIA. Oh, come on. Who's the head of the CIA? Pardon? General David Petraeus, a former military commander. The two units, the two organizations in many ways have, uh, have, um, have uh, um, uh, united. Um, the, the, the list of recent casualties of uh, um, al-Qaeda leaders in Afghanistan and Pakistan is pretty impressive. Um, in September 2010, uh, the, the chief of, of al-Qaeda operations was killed. Uh, bin Laden was killed in May 2011, a few, minute, a few uh, months after bin Laden's death. Um, uh, Abd al-Rahman, uh, the top operational planner, the second in charge of al-Qaeda after bin Laden's death, um, was uh, killed um, in one of these operations. Um, unlike before, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan has largely been unable to restock itself. Um, has uh, found it di increasingly difficult to maintain any sort of command and control over some sort of uh, international uh, jihadist uh, campaign. Um, the upper reaches of al-Qaeda, which is now uh, led by uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, uh, bin Laden's longtime number two, uh, is increasingly uh, isolated, uh, unable to raise funds, unable to communicate with underlings. Um, because of, of um, American infiltration and intelligence gathering, um, uh, Zawahiri and al-Qaeda leaders are really unable to trust go-betweens. Uh, this is, of course, what brought us to uh, bin Laden about a year ago. Uh, Al-Qaeda has largely been reduced to a, um, a propaganda dissemination organization. But already, um, in the years after 9-11, al-Qaeda had started to evolve, develop into a new kind of uh, organization. Um, and the model is an odd one, but it makes perfect sense. The model for how al-Qaeda has operated for the, at least a half a decade is basically the model of corporate franchising. Um, al-Qaeda has spawned dozens of local and regional affiliates um, that are basically locally owned and operated, uh, kind of like the McDonald's down the street, you might say. Um, these groups um, independently raise their own funds, recruit their own um, operatives, their own followers, their own terrorists. They plan their own missions, but all under something of a corporate brand, um, under a, uh, a, the banner, at least partly, of Al-Qaeda, using Al-Qaeda's message and at least in part, uh, the stated goals of, um, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, very importantly, the first of these sort of Al-Qaeda franchises, and I've not coined this, this phrase. Um, I've used it a lot, but I, I did not coin it. I think it's absolutely perfect. Um, the first of these Al-Qaeda franchises was Al-Qaeda in Iraq that did not exist before we invaded that country. Um, during uh, the heyday of al-Qaeda in Iraq, 2004, 2005, 6, 7, it still exists, but it's a shadow of its former self. Uh, during its heyday, it inflicted thousands of casualties, mostly on uh, uh, Iraqi uh, Shiites. Um, and al-Qaeda in Iraq really helped provoke, helped precipitate a, a sectarian civil war in Iraq. Uh, there are al-Qaeda franchises in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in liberated free uh, Libya, uh, all over the Middle East. Today the two most active al-Qaeda franchises are um, uh, al-Shabaab uh, uh, al in Somalia, which is a major, major participant in the civil war there, um, and also uh, uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which operates in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and particularly in Yemen, which has become uh, one of the most important safe havens for terrorists uh, today uh, because of the civil war there, because much of the country is ungovernable. 
Um, and Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has, in fact, been responsible for most of the international uh, attempts uh, using terrorism against the United States. Um, Abdul uh, Muttalib, the, uh, uh, the underwear bomber, for instance, um, the, um, uh, was uh, probably an, uh, an Al-Qaeda in uh, the Arabian Peninsula operative. Um, all this is to say that although Al-Qaeda in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan um, has largely been neutralized, to use a good military term, the military doesn't kill, the military neutralizes, um, the Al-Qaeda brand is still very much uh, alive and well, capable of killing um, uh, and uh, destabilizing um, Muslim countries. Um, and it's these Al-Qaeda affiliates that are really now most responsible for trying to bring what they would call the war uh, to the United States. I want to shift gears now um, and speak more directly of, a, um, uh, of something that takes us more deeply into the historical record, um, and a very, a very bizarre, very troubling one. Um, but it's one that's not unknown to people who study American history and culture uh, in its various, uh, various forms. It's this, really the stunning ability of, um, of Americans in lots of different facets of our, of our life and our history to face these extraordinary challenges, um, to, to nearly suffer extraordinary defeats, uh, to devise new means new tactics, new strategies, new frameworks for uh, making sense of the problem and solving it, um, and then achieving some kind of measure of success, only to completely forget what we've done. Americans are equipped with a bizarre sort of historical amnesia. Um, we, are, we speak all the time of founding fathers and this and that, but we have virtually no sense um, very little sense of history of, of these figures and what we've done, where we've failed, but also where we've succeeded. And that's, a, that's, that's unfathomable to most of the world, uh, a, a major country of 300 million people that's so unaware of its own history, even when, it, like I said, it's a history of success. This is one facet of this bizarre American future of, of American life is um, really the story of the United States and counterterrorism in the 20th century. Really more specifically the history of American involvement in counterinsurgency, which is different but related. I'm really going to be talking about counterinsurgency here. My story sounds like I'm telling you, sit back in your couch. My story begins century ago, more than a century uh, ago, uh, at the end of the uh, 1800s, 1890s, in uh, the Philippines. Um, the U.S., uh, the United States found itself an, an accidental imperial power because of its victory in the Spanish-American War. Um, we found ourselves in possession of imperial possessions, uh, like other European states, in this case, uh, particularly the, uh, uh, Cuba, and we're still dealing with that mess, um, and the Philippines. Um, but immediately after uh, the Philippines passed from Spanish to American ownership, we found ourselves facing an insurgency in Philippines because, oddly enough, the Filipinos had no more interest in being American subjects than they had been uh, than they had an interest in being Spanish subjects. Um, and uh, the U.S. responded with. Uh, overwhelming force. This is a, a chapter in American military history that's largely forgotten. At its peak, there were more than 125,000 American troops in the 1890s um, in uh, the Philippines. Um, and the Philippine insurgents responded with the, really the only tactics that probably made sense to them at the time, um, waging well, a strategy and then the tactics associated with it, a guerrilla campaign, and in many instances using what today we would really identify as um, terrorism. Um, the U.S. response was to use massive force, as if the United States was fighting a conventional army, a conventional war, as it had just been doing in the Spanish-American War on many fronts. Um, the, what went along with this war, uh, the uh, suppression of the, uh, the Philippine insurrection, was, is, is pretty disturbing stuff. Uh, the United States rounded up civilians, uh, created essentially concentration camps where they uh, um, 
uh, stuck uh, in excess of 300,000 Filipinos. Uh, the idea was to prevent the population from supplying uh, intelligence and recruits and food and supplies uh, to the insurgents. Um, the United States, uh, U.S. troops in the Philippines used waterboarding, um, used uh, other, which is torture, used other sorts of torture as well uh, against suspected insurgents, uh, massacres of civilians. It's a really horrible record. Um, um, and unfortunately, uh, this um, use of essentially counter-terror um, helped achieve American victory over the, uh, the Philippine insurgents. Um, but in the end, and this is really what I want to emphasize more here, the U.S. defeated insurgents in the Philippines also in large part because it figured out what was going on. Um, it, um, it adopted new tactics and strategies um, that relied uh, to give you a short list on gathering uh, and using more and better intelligence, using small units rather than large uh, units, small arms rather than, for its day and age, weapons of mass destruction, um, working more diligently to distinguish, um, at least in the field of battle, or the engagement between uh, combatants and non-combatants, um, um, using ambush and deception. Um, in, in a sense, you could say the Americans in the Philippines learned to fight as guerrillas against a guerrilla foe. Um, and then, very, very importantly, when the victory in the Philippines was close at hand, uh, the United States passed most control in the Philippines over to its own civilian authorities out of the hands of uh, military authorities, and it very much sought to try to create a sense of normalcy and sought in the Philippines um, to create a more legitimate um, uh, local government and one that was perceived as legitimate by the, uh, the local uh, population. One of the ways that this was done is to carry out the war, as it were, against guerrillas and insurgents and terrorists in civilian courts to make the claim that we do not need extraordinary measures to defeat this foe, we can treat terrorists like criminals and punish them as such. It took a while for the insurgency to really be wrapped up. Um, but, um, but this was an important part of it, learning to fight, uh, understanding the problem, and adopting tactics and strategies that were really much more uh, successful. These tactics and, and strategies were studied, not so much by Americans, but by others. Um, the British, for instance, in Malaya in the 1950s uh, applied a lot of these tactics and strategies on a much grander scale, and it's one of the uh, counterinsurgency campaigns that is frequently cited uh, in, the in the 20th century as a, as a model of success. Um, but here's where that peculiar American is picked in. The Americans uh, soon enough found themselves fighting in the Great War um, in Europe, uh, and those tactics and strategies were utterly useless. They were completely ill-suited to the war at hand. Um, what was needed was mastery of conventional war, um, weapons of mass destruction, an organization at a, an incredible level on a field of battle in which non-combatants had been virtually completely removed. Um, then, of course, there's the longer and much more intense American experience in World War II, and then again just a few years later in uh, Korea, further suppressed that memory of how to, of what, a, of what an insurgency was and what might be some appropriate tactics and strategies for fighting a counterinsurgency, or what these days is called low-intensity conflict. That memory was suppressed in favor of, the, of how to fight a um, a, a conventional war, a total war, and of course the Cold War, beginning in the late 1940s, further entrenched that because we weren't preparing uh, to fight communist guerrillas and, uh, and terrorists, we were preparing to fight the Soviet Red Army, uh, launching a massive attack across the, the plains of Central Europe and Germany. But um, then... Uh, history took a different turn. Um, the United States found itself um, in the 1960s 
uh, once again fighting in a country whose beaches were washed by the Pacific Ocean, uh, this time in um, Indochina, which is to say Vietnam. Um, and the Viet Minh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the revolutionary, uh, really nationalist uh, uh, Vietnamese forces, fought the United States using uh, a combination of tactics and strategies. The, 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 um, the Viet Minh deployed a conventional army, the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA. But at the same time, they used uh, the Viet Cong uh, to engage in guerrilla for warfare and, and actually also to engage in a lot of terrorism against South Vietnamese civilians, South Vietnamese leaders uh, who collaborated with um, uh, Americans, the American forces, um, or against South Vietnamese who simply expressed um, insufficient enthusiasm for Vietnamese nationalism and, uh, and, and communism. It was a classic case of the use of terrorism using symbolic violence to intimidate a civilian population. Um, and the United States, really conditioned by its experiences of fighting war in World War I, World War II, Korea prepared for a, a total war against the Soviets, responded in the only way that it had trained itself to respond. Uh, and they did this in Vietnam. A mass, large numbers of troops use massive firepower, seek to establish front lines and control territory, grind down the enemy uh, measure, particularly in the body counts that became so infamous during uh, much of the Vietnam uh, War. The problem was that except uh, on very rare occasions, like the Tet Offensive in January 68, the Viet Minh refused those bastards, they refused to fight the war that the Americans wanted to fight. How unsporting of them, you might say, I guess. Um, they fought a war that favored them on their territory, which, of course, makes perfect sense. Um, another group that did that, the American revolutionaries during the Revolutionary War. But that's a comparison we don't want to uh, pursue very long. Um, they were fighting on their own soil for liberation against a foreign foe. They were dedicated, the Viet Minh were, to achieving victory at any cost, no matter how long it took. Uh, they knew the territory, they knew the population, they used small units, they uh, could operate very efficiently using hit-and-run uh, tactics. They had a large population, some of which was sympathetic, some of which was terrorized into helping them, uh, that kept them awash in recruits and supplies and intelligence. They used terror. I mean, let's not paint the Viet Minh as, um, as, as kindly and beneficent. They used terror um, against their own population. And this is something, of course, that Americans forget. We imagine ourselves as the sole victims of that war and those tactics. Um, the South Vietnamese government, of course, never gained much legitimacy in the eyes of the, of the population either, and that didn't help it. Um, and for a very, very long time, the United States failed to appreciate what kind of war it was fighting in Vietnam. Simply did not engage that this was what we call today, at least in large part, a low-intensity uh, conflict. It was, of course, as I've just set up this comparison, a war that in many ways was like the Philippine insurgency, um, a, a conflict um, that could have provided a lot of clues, a lot of tactics and strategies um, for uh, the United States. Again, I'm not here to debate the wisdom of, of involvement in Vietnam. As historians, uh, as a historian, I guess I tend to look at this and say, we were there. We got there for a number of reasons. Well, what do you do then, and what happened? Well, given that, uh, the United States had no clue how to engage in this conflict uh, for a number of years. Um, but Americans are clever. I guess that's part of the story as well. Um, and the Americans in Vietnam began to grasp the essential nature of this war, its intricacies, its historical origins, and the United States began to develop well, new tactics and strategies which were not that new at all. They had used them themselves in the Philippines, the British had used them in Malaya, uh, the, the, there's a, other examples as well. The United States began to differentiate more between uh, the North Vietnamese conventional war and the Viet Cong guerrilla and terrorist operations, and the United States reacted accordingly. Uh, the United States began to rely much more on technology, intelligence, the use of small units, 
um, small arms, ambush, deception, um, fighting, in a sense, the Viet Cong on their terms, not American uh, terms. The real breakthrough, though, came uh, in reconceptualizing the Vietnam War for the Americans uh, when U.S. leaders, particularly military leaders, realized that high enemy body counts, um, well-manned front lines were absolutely useless in that war, that they in and of themselves could not win that war. So not only did the U.S. adopt new tactics and strategies, but it reconceptualized the very nature of the conflict and it redefined victory, what it would look like, what the metrics for it would be. In short, um, the United States military uh, began to believe that instead of simply fighting against an enemy for territory, um, that the local population was itself the battlefield. Um, and this gives us the much used and abused phrase, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the campaign to win hearts and minds, which actually came from the British campaign in Malaya uh, the previous uh, uh, decade. The United States worked a lot more closely with local populations, local leaders sought to build up the legitimacy of the, of the South Vietnamese government, its own reputation. Um, in particular, it uh, much better began to uh, coordinate uh, the work of the U.S. military, the U.S. intelligence, uh, U.S. Um, civil operations. Um, and the United States created field manuals and training programs, rejiggered boot camp, new courses at um, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, war colleges, even created a new model that actually placed on a spectrum different kinds of low-intensity conflict and conventional war to create a framework for conceptualizing uh, what this sort of conflict was. Um, the problem, of course, though, was that at this point the American public had basically given up on the war. This was too little, too late. Um, and the military pulled off an amazing strategic renaissance, but at the same time the, the military had cooked its own goose because for the, uh, the first half of the war um, the military had had gone, had spared no expense in convincing Americans that victory was right around the corner when victory was very, very far away. Um, so everybody looks bad in this. Um, but the thing is that, that this sort of renaissance came, uh, it was too little too late to really change the war. The, the irony here that I want to emphasize is that in the early 70s, the U.S. is leaving Vietnam, supposedly trying to achieve peace with honor, but really trying to, uh, to disengage, leave the war to the South Vietnamese, abandon them to um, defeat at the hands of the North Vietnamese, um, uh, trying its best not to admit that this was the first great military defeat in American history. Um, even as this was happening, the United States had figured out how maybe not to win that war, but at least how to wage it far more uh, successfully. Again, I'm not interested in debating the morality of waging that kind of war. That's a discussion that, that was had at the time and we need to talk about today. I'm talking about frameworks for waging a war. Um, and this, the, 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 these breakthroughs in terms of military tactics and strategies were enshrined in lots of documents, lots of practices. And very interestingly, from the 70s to the 90s, um, the U.S. military produced a, a generation of officers um, who earned academic degrees, people like David Petraeus, another uh, well-known figure, John Nagel, um, who wrote theses and dissertations in which they uh, historically analyzed the failure, but also the military renaissance in, um, in Vietnam. Um, and I would also like to note, I'm going to cut this short, uh, but I would like to note that our own, we, need to, we should know about this because our own General Krulak is a part of that, um, is a part of that generation, uh, a, a sort of warrior intellectual, we might say, um, who, when he was commandant of the Marine Corps and um, uh, intimately involved um, with military operations, obviously, in the second half of the 90s, um, helped oversee um, uh, peacekeeping missions in the former Yugoslavia. And he implemented, he articulated and implemented strategies um, that basically applied a lot of these lessons, not to carry out a counterinsurgency, that's not what the United States was doing in Yugoslavia, but to facilitate a peacekeeping mission in the midst of a low intensity uh, conflict. 
problem was, though, that that awareness, even when articulated from a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was overwhelmed by the impact of the, the larger context, which was um, the Cold War. The United States military was primarily engaged in trying to figure out when it broke out, if it broke out, how to defeat uh, the Soviet Union in a massive war. And then, of course, there was the, the experience of the first Gulf War in 1991, um, which was, um, uh, the, and the lesson there was, uh, you know, develop and trust in overwhelming firepower uh, and the concentration of force. This was the mindset um, when the United States chose to engage, again, as I put it, the elective war in 2003 against Iraq. Um, and if you remember, the strategy of shock and awe really sums that up quite nicely. Overwhelm the Iraqi military in its command and control abilities through overwhelming, del uh, uh, debil debilitating, terrifying uh, firepower. In a sense, that success, that strategy was too successful. We won so quickly and so overwhelmingly um, that it then pointed up quite glaringly our complete and total absence of any sort of plan for dealing with the aftermath. The assumptions were so thoroughly flawed. We believe we'd be treated as liberators, that there was an incipient Iraqi nation ready to rush up and fill that void. Um, that basically no occupation would be necessary. The country, though, instead descended into chaos, and as I've discussed, for instance, with the, uh, the emergency of al-Qaeda in Iraq, it developed into a new front in the war on terror. But the problem was we were utterly unprepared for that kind of war, and that's, of course, what also made the occupation in Iraq so much more problematic and helped make us enablers of a new uh, uh, terrorist campaign um, carried out by al-Qaeda in Iraq and Ba'athist insurgencies and others against American military personnel and, in particular, of course, this new Shia-dominated uh, Iraqi uh, government. Um, our initial response was fight as we were prepared to fight. Wage conventional war, but against whom? Overwhelming firepower, large military units. Um, this played right into the hands of the Iraqi insurgents uh, who hid within the Iraqi population and used tactics that were intended to provoke. And what we, did we do? We rose to the occasion. Uh, the American forces uh, took the bait, as it were, and made this conflict even worse. As I said, turned it into a front in the war on terror. But then the American military again did something quite extraordinary. And this time, within the space of a couple of years, top to bottom renaissance, revolution uh, in the uh, American um, military. Within the space of a couple of years, a completely new mindset was introduced um, in the United States military um, that really overtook the uh, several generations old emphasis on conventional war, in part by drawing on people like David Petraeus, um, and uh, implemented a new strategy uh, accompanied by the, um, the, the surge in 2007, uh, the uh, intelligent application of uh, more troops. Um, the so-called Petraeus plan and the surge um, helped turn the course uh, in the war in Iraq. Uh, there are a lot of other factors, but that very much uh, played into it. Um, and the United States has mostly left Iraq it's still a, a fragile country. Our position in the Middle East because of the war is very uh, um, dangerous uh, and fraught with peril. Um, but it is not right to draw a parallel between Iraq today as we have left it and Vietnam as we left it in um, 1972, really, uh, you could say, um, because of this military renaissance in um, uh, that happened very, very quickly. Um, well, it's un we're unsure where things are going in Afghanistan. The metrics are, the information from metrics is very, very mixed. Um, uh, and the, the future there is in doubt. What's really amazing, though, that even as we are basically out of Iraq, preparing to leave Afghanistan, we've already begun to pivot 
towards new challenges. And just within the last few months, the Obama administration uh, has released a new document basically laying out what it imagines to be the challenges in the future uh, and the framework for facing those challenges. And the principal challenges in that dark document aren't low-intensity conflict. They are China. They are the rise of a new superpower. And, of course, what does that man demand? In particular, preparation for conventional war. Um, so what I find so troubling at the moment is once again when we have developed and we have been able to identify what is different about low-intensity conflict, guerrilla warfare, insurgency, terrorism. We've developed strategies that in many ways are very successful against them. We are once again positioning ourselves to abandon that knowledge and we're going to have to learn those lessons all over again because it doesn't matter to what degree we seek peace, we will have to deal with people who want to use guerrilla warfare, terrorism, and insurgency. We will be forced to learn these lessons again and we're already preparing to abandon what we've learned. History is powerful stuff, um, I'm here to tell you. And, and when we abandon that history, it, Amer Americans are good at forgetting their past. And that can be a good thing. A kind of historical amnesia lets you get back in the saddle again, um, not burdened by the past in the way that we might say Europe was for so much of the, its last, its, its recent history, by recent I mean a couple centuries. But also forgetting that past dooms you to committing the same mistakes over again and relies on you in the future to rediscover the wisdom that you've lost. Um, and so we're, we find ourselves at a very interesting moment. Thank you very much.